Father, we bless you, we extol you, we magnify you. Because in our life, we have truly searched all over and found nobody who's greater than you. You've done for us what no other person or entity could do. You rescued our lives. We stand here, rescued men, women, boys, and girls. It's no easy rescue. The ransom was your life. Whoo! The ransom was a life for a life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Money couldn't purchase us. Bulls and bullocks couldn't purchase us. It took the precious lamb. Thank you for rescuing us. We say with one collective voice, we are never, we're never going back. So we open your word. We pray that you would open our eyes to wondrous truths from thy law. Teach us your precepts and we will observe to keep them with a whole heart sanctify our minds and hearts as we have sanctified this hour to hear from you. Meet us here. Prepare us for the week ahead as we decree it too is sanctified. Cause fruit to be born from your word in our lives this week. Cause men and women, boys and girls who have not known of you to hear of you, to experience you, to, to come to know you because we've taken this time we love you with our whole hearts. We pray that you would um, that you would call in every wandering mind, that you would restore every broken, every broken heart, that you would mend every broken relationship, that you would shift us to a new place, a new dimension of walking with you shift us in this place today so that we see you like we've never seen you before. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said hallelujah. hallelujah. Say it one more time. Hallelujah. Say it one more time. Before you take your seats, if you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, there you'll find our theme verses for the month. I read out of the Amplified. If you don't have the Amplified, don't let that bother you. It should be on the monitors behind you. Here's how it reads. But I tell you something. I tell you, I'm sorry, something greater and more exalted and more majestic than the temple is here. And if you had only known what this saying means, I desire mercy, readiness to help, to spare, to forgive, rather than sacrifice and sacrificial victims, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Everybody shout, all right. All right. Say it again. Say it one more time. I think for this month, nobody greater. Say it with me, nobody. And then our subtopic for today, Jesus is greater than the temple. Say it with me, Jesus is. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I gave you quite a few notes. I want to make sure that for those of us who are... Um, who are new to church or been in church for a while, that we start to get an understanding a little bit of what the idea of heaven was in uh, putting the church together in the building and the people who show up that make up the church. Everybody shout all right. So I want to talk a little bit. I told you last week that as we began to think about the greatness of Jesus this month, as we began to think about not only who he said he was, but who he actually proved to be, that I think it is important that in this year of restored vision that the church gets back to a place of hollowing the name of Jesus and make him, making him bigger than what church you go to, what denomination you're in, and all of the above. Are y'all listening to me? 
I think that religion has done a poor job of representing what God wants to be in the life of his creation. And so we hope to bring your mind back to that place. No matter what church you're a part of, no matter how you grew up, it is important that you get to know the resurrected Christ. Everybody shout all right. I want to take you, um, again, in Matthew 12, Jesus has this interesting conversation, and he only has it in Matthew 12. Nowhere else in the Synoptic Gospels do we hear Jesus, brother, say what he says in Matthew 12. What does he say that is so unique? He says that I want to tell you this, that you guys extol, you hollow the temple that, that has been created in honor of God, and that's fine. I'm not mad at the building, but unfortunately, you guys are so committed to the building, you have lost sight of the Lord of the building. Are y'all listening to me? I said, are y'all listening to me? You guys have gotten so caught up in your name, you have lost sight of the power of my name. Are y'all listening to me? Everybody shout, Lord, help us. And so then Jesus says, I'm greater than the temple. One greater than the temple has showed up in your life. One of the things that I wanted to do is not talk about the temple building down through history, although it's its uh, purpose in history has been great. I mean, all the way from the temple, the tabernacle in Moses' day, to the temple that Solomon built, all the way to the temple that the Jews were in when Jesus showed up, all the way to the church as we know it today. It has been significant in the lives of those who gather in its institution or its building. Everybody shout, okay, we have that. But I want to talk to you about the layout of the temple, similar to the layout of the tabernacle. And then I want to make my way into using some of the furnishings to talk about why Jesus is greater than the temple. And then I will take my seats. Everybody, I don't have multiple seats. I will take my seat. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit. So when you showed up, some of y'all looking like, yeah, it was his seat. So how many people are there? It's uh, by seat, by seat. Now watch this. When you showed up at the temple in Jesus' day, and this is important, you showed up, and the temple had basically three dimensions, just like the tabernacle that God told Moses to build. Everybody shout, we know that. If you don't know that, you're going to know it a little bit. Those three dimensions of the court were what we know as the... First, you would come to the, and then you would go to the, and then you would go to the, the Holy of Holies. Yeah, the, the outer court, the outer court is the place, and I want you to just make sure you make note of it, where everyone gathered. Everyone gathered. Everybody shout, everyone gathered. Where at? In the outer court. How many people gathered out there? The outer court was the place of grace. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. How did you get here, Sister Tashel? Grace. Yeah, she was like, I think in my car. No, grace got you here. <laughs> how, did, how did you, uh, Brother Carl, how did you get here? Grace. It doesn't matter. The beauty of the temple is that it is always, it was always supposed to be a place where it didn't matter where you came from, everyone could gather here. Y'all with me? It didn't matter. It didn't matter whether you were whether you were male or female. Doesn't matter whether you were rich or poor. Doesn't matter whether you're monogamous or an adulterer. Doesn't matter whether you're straight or gay. Doesn't the Bible the Bible the temple calls all men to the out of court because it is the place of grace. Doesn't matter if you're drunk or sober. Doesn't matter if you're high or sober. Doesn't matter if you're addicted or not. The Bible calls the temple to be a place where everybody can gather. I wish you would shout to the Lord, thank you for grace. Grace allows us to all show up no matter where we come from, no matter what our proclivities are, no matter what our entanglements have been, and it says this is the place where all can come. The outer court. There were two pieces of furniture in the outer court that are important, and I put them in your notes. First, you would come to the bronze altar. Everybody shout the bronze altar. The bronze altar was the place where whenever you came, no matter who you were, you had to come to the bronze altar because it was there that lambs were slaughtered. 
Hallelujah. And so you could come from a life of, of pornography, a life of homosexuality, a life of sexual promiscuity, a life of stealing, lying, drugging, whatever you can think of, a life of murder. And when you showed up to this place where everybody showed up, boom, we slaughter lambs. It's a very bloody place. It's a very messy place because God wanted you to understand that grace for you is free, but it cost him everything. Hallelujah. See, the beauty of the temple, the beauty of Jesus and what makes him greater than the temple is many times we get inside of the building and we have conversations that God doesn't even want us to get bogged down in. We like to major in minors. Do you speak in tongues? What have you been doing? Where did you come from? Did you mess up yesterday? God says, listen, what the temple should represent, what I represent is that all of you messed up. Before we can even get to a new dimension in me, we got to walk through blood. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the bronze altar was there, and then we get to the next step out to the altar to the brazen laver, and this is the place where you washed up. Hallelujah. After getting all bloody, you washed up. Oh, hallelujah. So there were two pieces of furniture, the bronze altar the brazen labor. I want you to note with me that none of them were gold because bronze is synonymous with not your best. It's, it's, it's synonymous with you can get better. That's what happened in the outer court. Here is the problem with the church. The church has come to the outer court of the temple and being content just to exist in a place where we just keep slaughtering the lamb. And keep trying to cleanse our conscience from the guilt of yesterday. And all we know about temple worship or about church is that we gather on Sunday and we come up and say, Lord, forgive me for Monday, forgive me for Monday through Saturday. And the beauty of the labor is the labor is supposed to be the place where you start to get your mind changed. Because the beauty of grace is that grace shows up. The lamb is only slaughtered as you and I learn repentance. What's supposed to happen right here is we are standing in the outer court as our minds begin to change about the behaviors that led to the lamb being slaughtered. And us needed to be washed again. Hallelujah. Would you do me a favor and shout Pastor White? I'm so grateful to be in this place. Just say it with me. Say, Pastor White, you may not realize it, but my mind is changing. Yeah, that's what's supposed to happen as we enter into When we pull up on the campus, we're supposed to have a changed mind. Whatever I thought was okay before I got here, you have washed me over again. Somebody shout, yes, Lord. Then we move to the inner court. This is this is the place where in the temple day and in the tabernacle, everyone could not go here. As a matter of fact, it was, it was literally in Jesus' day, Jew, Jew, Jews and Gentiles representing the entire world could gather in the outer court, but only Jews could go in the inner court. Jesus is going to make amends for that because he's greater than the temple. He, does, he is not selective in who he allows in. Hallelujah. I'm preaching better than y'all listening. I said, Hallelujah. Just look over at somebody and tell them, if Jesus was selective about who he let in, tell them, I know I would have been left out. But, oh, thank you for grace. I'm sorry I got excited. That's what that O was about. Because I know that if he was looking for perfection, I wouldn't be here. I would have had to stay out. But then the inner court allows us a, to come in closer. And once you get to the inner court, this is the place, not of grace, but of sanctification. Grace brought us here. And now God says, now we done, we done change your mind. Now let's clean you all the way up. Let's purify you. Hallelujah. I wish I had somebody that was being sanctified, set apart for God's work that would shout, yeah, hallelujah. Say it again. The temple is never, the church was never supposed to be a place where all gathered and we just did our own thing and had our own programs and ran our own agendas. It was also always supposed to be a place of progressive grace, a place where grace got us here, but then we got sanctified in the thing that God had brought us here to do. 
Jesus shows up in his day, and these people are content to just stand like they came, having conversations that would not change anybody. And he says, you have missed the use of the temple. I didn't call you in here to have conversations y'all could have had in the privacy of your homes and on your jobs. I came in here to sanctify you so you could take a purified mind to your homes and to your jobs. Hallelujah. Would you do me a favor and shout, Pastor White, we're listening. Say it again. Inside of, inside of the holy, the most holy place, the inner court, were three uh, furnishings that I want you to take note of. The first was the table of shewbread. The table of shewbread. I, 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 I put in your notes John chapter 6 because this was a representation, the table of showbread. It was a representation of what Jesus was trying to remind us of in John 6 when he says, Yo, your fathers ate bread which came down from heaven, but they died. But he that eateth of this bread shall live forevermore. Jesus said, I want to be clear, I'm greater than the temple because the temple can feed you temporarily, good God Almighty, but I came to satisfy you for a lifetime. Bread of heaven! Yeah, it's always also symbolic of the fact that when you show up to church, to the temple, you can't show up to hear man reason and talk about cars and houses and fame. You need the word of God. You need the you need the bread of heaven. You need to be edified in the word. So the table of showbread was there. And every time they entered it, they had to stop at the table. And it was this place of nourishment because here's the reality. Many of us, we are, we do a lot to lead and to to, to carry what God has called us to carry on Monday through Saturday. But today it's about us being filled again. Because you can't keep leading and giving if you on empty. Somebody shout, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Say it again. Yes, and so they stopped at the table of showbread. And then next on the other side, as you two went a step further into the inner court, there was the, the golden candlestick. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. It was gold. So this was representative of each of us who individually make up the church and the reality that you and I can only shine as the Holy Spirit gives us light to shine. It was this recognition that you are totally dependent, not upon your own flame, but on the flame of the Spirit of God to keep you ignited. And, and, and it's frustrating that many folk live their lives in the outer court of the church. They show up the church. They have position in the church. But but the spirit is flaming out. Would you do me a favor, put your hands on yourself and shout, I can't make it without the spirit of God. Yeah, Jesus says to us, and I want you to just understand some of the conversation when you read scripture in Matthew 5, Jesus says, hey, uh, Elder Rick, hey, you are the light of the world. What are you talking about? You're the golden candlestick. That's what I'm talking about. You're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. Let your light so shine that they may and do what? Because the light that's shining through you is greater than the vessel that is shining through. You don't stop at the golden candlestick in worship. You worship the light that it is reflecting upon, pointing to. Hallelujah. The next place, which is going to be, is good because this is the next stop before you can go to the most holy place. This is the altar of incense. Huh. This is the place where continual prayers were made up to heaven. Incense represents the prayers of the righteous going up always unto heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you do me a favor and shout to somebody, tell them prayer still matters. <laughs> Say it again, prayer. And every time they showed up to the tabernacle or to the temple, it went like this. They would come in, everybody's welcome. Slaughter a lamb, tiptoe through the blood, get to the lab or clean up. 
What are we cleaning up for? We're about to go a, a step further. Some stuff we got to leave out here we can't take inside. Are y'all listening to me? Show up in the word of God. Feed me table of showbread. Table of showbread. As I'm fed by the word, Holy Spirit, allow your light to shine through me. And all of a sudden, I'm illuminated. But not for me, not for my glory. You don't need to know my name. You don't know need to know much about me. All you need to know is greater is he that is than he that is and before we go a step further, God says, bow down and make your prayers known unto me. After the word, after you've been filled, you still need to pray. And some of you only pray when you're in trouble. And some of you think prayer is to be used for you when you need a bailout. But God says, no, before you come into the most holy place, you need to pray, sanctify your heart, sanctify your mind before you meet me. Hallelujah. Which brought us to the next place. The third place was the most holy place. It is here that we see glorification. <laughs> we went from grace, because grace brings justification. Then we stepped in and we said, okay, I, I've been justified by the blood of the Lamb. Now I'm ready to go a step further into the, into the inner court. In the inner court, I find sanctification. Good God Almighty. My mind was changing, but not my heart is changing. And places I used to go, I don't want to go anymore. And that's why this is a gathering for all people. Because I want all of you here. And I don't really care where you come from. I don't even really care what you were a part of before you got here. Just get to the outer court and watch the slaughtering of the lamb. And see if it doesn't change your mind about what you are a part of. Y'all not listening to me. And if the church is to be the beacon of light and hope that it's supposed to be, the people of the church will have to learn that greater than our gathering is our Lord. And more important than the name on our buildings is the name that we proclaim. And that name asks for everybody to show up. And for everybody to have their consciousness cleansed. Somebody shout, yes, Lord. For everybody to take the next step and eat from the word of God at the table of showbread. For every person to recognize that the Holy Spirit has come to give all to your light. I feel like I'm growing down, Pastor White. That's okay. The Holy Spirit, he still has. There's still more oil. What do I need to do? Get to that altar of incense. I feel away from God. It's because you've been trying to run into his presence. And like the tabernacle of the Old Testament, the glory is gold. You don't get glorification just because you wanted to run in and out anyway. God said, that's a way you enter my presence. God said, that's some things that that you've been trying to hold on to. You can't drag into here. We got to get it right in the word at the table of showbread. And so then the beauty of God is that God is greater than the temple because some things that the temple will accept. God says no. And some things that you can get over on the people in the house. The Lord of the house says, come up higher. Before you could go to the most holy place, to the holy of holies, there was a veil. It was dark back there. And there was a veil. But the light from the candles helped us to see. What are you saying? The letter kill it, but the spirit gives life. And there are some things you're not going to see in God until you are ready to submit to the spirit of God so that he can open the eyes of our hearts, the ears of our understanding, so that we can sup with God for a while. I really hope that whether you're watching me on screen or in here today, I really hope that you recognize that the answer to the ills of this world is not found in politics, it's not found in your job, 
It is found in the one who is greater than the temple. Jesus of Nazareth offers hope to a dying world. And if the world is to be exposed to that hope, the people that gather in our churches week in and week out must have their consciences changed, their minds renewed in the word of our great God. The most holy place was reserved only for the priests and even the priests, and even the priests could only go once a year. It was a sacred place. He could only go once a year, and it is crazy if you look at the tabernacle and take it all the way over to the, to the temple. Even the priest, when he went in, he had to put his most holy garbs on. He put his robe on, and at the bottom of the robe was a veil. And he would walk around in there in the presence of God. But if he had come in without taking the proper steps, he would pass away. Because the presence of your God is a consuming fire. And, and you couldn't go in to get him, so they had to just grab the bales and pull them out from beyond the veil. Just a way of God just trying to hone in and magnify how important walking with him is for your existence. So Jesus shows up in a day where they are, they're sort of making a mockery of this whole temple experience. And the temple is sort of used like any other building. It is sort of used like any other place in their time. And he shows up, and he is healing on the Sabbath. And they said, our temple rules don't allow for healing on the Saturday. Who do you think you are? And he says, oh, man, who am I? Who, who am I? He says, I'm the one who is greater than the temple. There isn't a rule that the temple can give you that is greater than the rule giver. And so he shows up, and he just sort of gets in their face like he does yours and mine. Everybody shout, all right, Pastor White. The only furnishing that we want to talk about today that was inside of the, the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, is the Ark of the Covenant. It was gold. It said here, do y'all remember, how many of you know the Ark of the Covenant well? Y'all remember when David became king, and he went down to get what? The Ark of the Covenant, because the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen um, when they had been ravished and all above. And he said, we can't keep having church without the presence of God, because this represented the presence of God right here. Y'all with me? Everybody shout, yeah. Shout it back at me, say, Pastor White, let's not keep having church without the, without the presence of God. So David went and got the Ark, and they were bringing it back. Come over here, Brother Smith. I know you look good hold, holding your wife right now, but I need you. Come here, Brother Kevin. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And they were carrying. They were taking the art. This is a small art, but the art was a little bigger. They were carrying it. And as they were bringing it back, David was out, you know, dancing and singing and all that stuff. And it started to wobble. It started to wobble. Come here, um, Brother Rise. You can't be elder right now. You're going to be Uzzah right now. And Uzzah reached out his hands and put his hands on it. But he hadn't been purified. He hadn't been authorized to be that, to do that. So, boom, he dies. At that moment, David looks. And the Bible says he got offended with God because he says, oh, God. And he says, let's take this back and put this in Obed-Edom's house. Put this over here in Obed-Edom's house for a while. And they went back. And David went to his altar and he says, God, I don't understand what's going on. And for three months, he's just dying there praying, God, teach us how to bring it back. And the Bible says, word got to David that the whole house was blessed because the ark of God. I want to say this to you no matter where you are. While people are trying to give you antidotes and ways to, to live a more prosperous life, you want to know the greatest blessing over your house and life? It is the presence of God. Now, I'm not talking to everybody, but somebody that's tried doing it the world's way and has tried doing it God's way, if God is a greater blessing to your life than anything the world could offer, stand real quick and give God a great big O. I'm talking about when you were in a place that money couldn't get you out of, the presence of God. I'm talking about when your mind was running rampant and you couldn't find any peace, the presence of God. 
I'm talking about when your heart was overwhelmed and earth didn't have a solution. The presence of God. I understand better what the songwriter was saying when he said, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Bless me now. My Savior. It's no matter what life throws at me, I come. Tell you, there's been no greater blessing on my life than to be able to come to God. So they went back and they got the ark. And David literally danced out his clothes. What do you do when the presence of God is coming home? How can you not dance? How can you not cut a fool? Whoa, when the thing that blesses you more than anything you've ever seen, when the, I'm talking about the thing that fills you and makes you whole, the presence of God is on its way back to your house. How can you not throw a party? And so he parted all the way, and they set it back. This right here is why I want to tell you, the contents of this ark is what makes Jesus greater than the temple. What made this ark so great? The ark was gold. On top were beaten wings. Gold, remember, what's in the outer court? Bronze. <laughs> yeah, this is gold. See, this has been purified. Yeah, 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 yeah. The presence of God purifies. Cherubim wings overlay it because God wants to remind you when you enter his presence, everything is crying holy. You say, why the cherubim rings? Read Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And I heard the angels saying, Holy! Holy, holy. See, this is what I'm trying to tell you, that the beauty of God is God says, I wasn't coming then, and I'm not coming now. Don't treat me like I am. Everybody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Inside of here were three things. This is what makes Jesus greater. First, there was Aaron's rod that budded, representing the fact that the temple was a place of authority, but Jesus is the greatest authority. Because although, you see this right here? What, what is this? Is this connected to its, to its um, source of life? No. What's going to happen if this stays disconnected from its source of life? It's going to die. Jesus says, okay, this represents all of you. And you can show up to a building all your life, but if he can't give you life, <laughs> you're going to still die. What I've made up my mind is that, Jesus, I know I've got to worship you above a building because the last thing I could do is come to the building and die. And here's the beauty. Jesus says, Aaron's rod represents the fact that when I'm in your life, I can make dead things come to life again. So I'm not talking to everybody, but someone who is seeing your life bud again. See, while the enemy wants to get you to hold your head down about what you, what's not right and how many trials you have, Jesus says, look at your life. It's budding again. And even if you can't make it to the house, if you can make it to me, I'll cause dead things to live again. Yeah. 
And the beauty of it, the flip side is, you can come to the house and not look to me and you will still be dead. And so the first thing is, Jesus says, I'm greater than the temple, says Luana, because I am the life giver, not your house of worship. And when I give life, you come to the house of worship to bless me for the life I've given you. Hallelujah. Second in there was a golden pot of manna. Keep it there, please. Golden pot of manna. This represents, y'all know y'all Bible, right? Y'all good? I'm sorry. If you came here for me to talk about anything other than the Bible, I'm sorry. That's all I know to talk about. I'm like, really, is this what we came here to talk about? Yep. <laughs> Golden pot of manna. Golden pot of manna. This represents total fulfillment. This represents the fact that the temple accepts some, but Jesus accepts all. Here's what the Lord said to me as I was, I've been planning for this, Sister Dana. The, the Lord said this to me. He said, boy, let me tell you something. The proof that I have accepted you is in that golden pot of manna. I said, what do you mean? It's just, it's just bread that you fed them with from heaven, and they didn't know what it was. He said, that's what I'm telling you. The proof that I've accepted you is the fact that all your life I've been taking care of you. I said, all my life? He said, all your life. He said, if I hadn't accepted you, how would you have gotten here? And I said, I never would have made it without you. He said, and that's proof that before you ever knew who you were, Sister so Lawana, I fed you. And before you ever made your way to new life, God says, the reason you couldn't die it's because I took care of you and fed you. But I didn't know you, but I knew you. So to anybody that the enemy's trying, been trying to beat up with shame and guilt and make you fit, feel like you might not be accepted, God says, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm greater than the temple because people may hold you hostage to your yesterday. But they took me hostage so you could be free today. I'll say it again. People may hold you hostage because of your yesterday. But Jesus says they took me hostage so that you could be free today. <laughs> I think about how many young people live right now. They'll go to school and they'll hold their head down. They'll feel like they can't fit in. They, they'll go through identity crisis trying to figure out what does the culture want? Do they want me to be this or be that? What do they want from me? So that I can just fit in. I just want to be like, I just want to be liked. I just want to. And Jesus said, if only you knew that before any person affirms you or accepts you, I already have. That's the beauty of the presence of God. That's the beauty of the presence of Jesus in your life. That he makes you okay before people think you're okay. He makes you cool before they say you're cool. He accepts you and perfects you just like you are. I said it before. People tell me all the time, Ray, when I get myself together, I won't come to Jesus. I know you can't get yourself together. That's what I'm telling you. The, the rod won't bud until you get to him. No matter what you do, this won't come back to life unless you get to him. You can sit in a building until they take you out of this world. But until you get to the one that's greater than the building, you won't bud. I want to talk to budding folk. I want to talk to people that want to, to live again. And I want to tell you I know that you can live again. Because before you ever knew it, Whoa! He was, he was providing for you with stuff you didn't even know. Making ways you didn't even know how. Opening doors you didn't even know why. Whoa! Because I accepted you before 
you ever accepted me. But now that you accepted me, he says now, Number three, there was the Ten Commandments. There was the, there was the place of the place of the law inside the box. This is the place of accountability. And Jesus says, "I'm greater than the temple because your people may be okay with your with your funny acting ways and your your messy living, but I'm not." So he says, the temple may look away if you have a title and say, oh, it's okay. You sleep around a little bit? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, you, 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 you. And they say, yeah, that's okay. But God says, no, 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 no. I'm greater than the temple. The, the law is in here. The law is in here. And before you go to anybody to try to get them to okay, what did I say? Well, Lord, they said, they okay. I, they said, as long as I'm serving, I can shack up. He says, okay, let's look in my law. And so... And so God said, Elder Riquet, the temple, it calls us all to accountability. But Jesus calls us to a higher, a higher standard of accountability. Jesus was walking, and they says, um, Rabbi. He says, yeah. They said to him, they said, uh, they said uh, the law says that if we, we catch someone in adultery that that, uh, you know, we can do this and do that. He said, yeah, that's what the law says. He says, I say, if you look on a woman and you lust, you've already committed adultery. He said, I'm greater than the temple. I call you to a higher account. I call you not to just guard your actions, but to guard your mind. I call you to sanctify yourself in a whole new place. So that when you and I leave here today, we're so ravished with the love of God that we walk with a new authority on our lives. Every time someone joins our ministry, I say, are you willing to represent God as well as this ministry well? Because you can represent the ministry well and misrepresent God. But God in this ministry well, yeah, what are you asking me? Are you willing to walk with a new level of authority over your life? I am Pastor White, but sometimes I feel bad and I feel like I've done too much to offer um, my gifts and talents to the church and I feel like I don't fit in. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. There's a golden pot of matter that is proof that long before you were ever worth it, Jesus said you're worth it. And he has accepted you and you don't have to go and get better. He just want to make you better. But here's the thing, many people accept the greatest gift life has, and then they take it for granted. So Jesus says, I want to call you to a whole new level of account. If you can't make it to church today, okay, I want to call you higher to a higher level of accountability. I want to put my law in your heart so you don't have to guess how I feel about what you're about to engage in. Now, none of this will matter if we don't allow the love of God to pull us closer to him than ever before. But what happens in the temple through the, from the outer court to the inner court to the most holy place is that the love of God is just pulling our heart to a whole new, plebble, whole new place of accountability. So when you get into the presence of God, guess what? Whatever has been hindering your relationship, it just breaks. But the last thing I want to do. It's misuse the love of God. So we sing this song. Your love.